Good evening and welcome to this annual brochures lecture. It is my very great pleasure to introduce Sir Malcolm Evans, who has very kindly agreed to give this annual lecture tonight. Actually, I do not quite believe that Sir Malcolm needs any introduction uh, to you all, but just in case some of you are not familiar with his work, uh, Sir Malcolm is Professor of Public International Law at the University of Bristol. He's also a member of the UK Foreign Secretary's Human Rights Advisory Group. And he has recently been elected as a member of the Institut de Droit International. Of course, many of you will also know that Sir Malcolm has had a special relationship with the British Institute of International and Comparative Law over the years, and in particular, um, as he is currently the co-general editor of the ICLQ, the uh, International and Comparative Law Quarterly, which is published by the Institute. Uh, and I would just briefly like to add that Whenever I hear from colleagues who have worked or who are currently working with Sir Malcolm on this publication, they only ever have very nice things to say about him. He's not only very efficient, but also delightful to work with. So I'm particularly grateful uh, to him. We're all grateful to him for his support to the Institute in general and for having agreed to give this lecture tonight. He will tackle a rather difficult topic and try to answer a question that has been um, sought to be answered for, uh, I guess, nearly two decade now, uh, decades now. And this is what uh, is to become of the UN Human Rights Treaty Body System. Uh, he will be focusing on one of the Human Rights Committee's core tasks, which is uh, the monitoring of state implementation of the treaty obligations through the reporting mechanism. And he's, of course, an ideal uh, person to try to answer that very challenging question because he's the former chair of the UN Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture. Uh, he was the chair of the subcommittee for a decade, for the last 10 years. And as the chair of that subcommittee, he was also a member of the meeting of all of the chairs of the treaty bodies. And this means that he has already actually played a rather active role in the efforts in that improving uh, this, this monitoring uh, system. Now, Sir Malcolm will be speaking for approximately 30 minutes and we'll then move on to a Q&A session. I'll start by asking him a couple of questions and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Now, I'm sure most of you, all of you are very familiar with the Zoom functions by now, maybe too familiar with the Zoom functions by now, but I would like to uh, encourage you to use the Q&A function and to ask in writing your questions along the way as this is gonna facilitate uh, the Q&A session towards the end. So now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor over to Sir Malcolm Evans. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm delighted and honoured to be asked to give this uh, lecture um, this evening. I nearly said here this evening. I would be I will admit it's wonderful to be able to do it on Zoom. One can uh, contact with so many more people than might otherwise be the case, but there is a degree of regret that we can't be here together whilst it's taking place. But we must take advantage of the, uh, the benefits that we, that we can have of, of, of working in this way at the moment. And that is something that we will be coming back to in the course of the lecture and discussion later on this evening, so it's not an entirely gratuitous aside. Um, the theme of the lecture, as, um, as has been said, is looking at the, the reform, reformation, the future of the human rights treaty body system. Back in 2012, the UN Secretary General described the UN human rights treaty body system as, quote, one of the greatest achievements in the history of the global struggle for human rights. Yet, if it is a jewel in the crown, then to be blunt, it fails to sparkle. Indeed, some would say it has become dulled and diminished. It continues to teeter on the brink of collapse and what energies surround the system in recent years have become largely focused on ensuring that it continues to function at all rather than it continues to function well. 
Even this may be an overly optimistic assessment, given the levels of disinterest in or palpable ill will displayed by many states towards the treaty bodies during the series of discussions which have taken place within the United Nations concerning the rather euphemistically labelled treaty strengthening process over much of the last 10 years. And it is to that which I wish to focus my attention this evening. Indeed, the very language of treaty body strengthening itself reflects a move away from the agendas of treaty body reform, which were prevalent some 20, even 30 years ago. However, what is needed now is not so much the strengthening of the system, nor indeed its reform, but probably a wholesale reformation in thinking concerning the role and functioning of the treaty bodies as means of furthering the implementation of states' human rights commitments. By way of general background, the treaty body system, to use that expression, currently comprises 10 treaty bodies, established by the two covenants of 1966, seven conventions and one optional protocol, rather confusingly. That system has grown over time, but has had a fairly fixed appearance for the last 15 years. During that time, however, the overall number of states parties to those treaties has risen considerably. And today, there are nearly 1500 ratifications by states to those 10 treaties overall. And that is of significance, which again, we will be coming back to. As has already been said, there are three main scrutiny functions which treaty bodies exercise, consideration of reports submitted by states parties, consideration of communications from both individuals and of late for a while from states, and inquiries. In practice, for both the treaty bodies and for states parties, the reporting process lies at the heart of their work and their relationship, not least because it is the only element which is compulsory for all states to the nine treaties which have this process. Oddly, I exempt my own committee, the SPT, from these figures now, having included it in the system, because as I will briefly mention later, its work is, is of a very different order. But if the reporting process lies at the heart of the work of the, of the treaty bodies and their relationship with states, there's are asymmetric viewpoints. A state looking at the system sees up to nine different treaty bodies to which it needs to submit reports, sometimes on quite similar, some would say overlapping issues. The treaty bodies see the number of reports which are submitted to it, and importantly, the numbers which are not. Treaty bodies tend to see the coherence and, integ and integrity of their work. States parties tend to see the differences in the working practices and the ways in which treaty bodies might go about their work and what they might say on substantive issues. And so the viewpoints are rather different. And of course, if states don't like what the treaty bodies are doing, then they ask themselves, why should they pay for it? For that is ultimately what they do. And that is indeed the question which they ultimately ask. One might say that whilst the human rights treaty bodies see the treaties as creating a system of treaty bodies, states increasingly see the treaties as establishing a treaty body system. And the difference is important. Whereas the treaty bodies see themselves as separate entities each able to determine for themselves how to go about doing their work, states tend to see them as bodies undertaking similar functions which should function in similar ways. But why does this matter? An increased number of treaty bodies with an increasing number of states parties should result in an increasing number of reports to be examined. Yet an increased rates of submission of reports would simply compound the, prob the principal practical problem which faces the treaty bodies and has become quite stark in recent years. 
And the sit problem is simple. It just does not have the capacity to consider the number of reports which are supposed to be submitted to it. It just can't go about doing its job. In 2012, the then High Commissioner, Navi Pile, spoke the truth when she said that the only reason that the reporting system had not completely collapsed was because so many states failed to honour their obligation to report at all that it was possible for it to limp on. A system which relies on non-compliance to survive is indeed a system in crisis. By way of response to that crisis, in April 2014, the UN Secretary General Assembly adopted Resolution 68268 entitled Strengthening and Enhancing the Effective Functioning of the Human Rights Treaty Body System. Well, if they say so. Nevertheless, this was a surprisingly welcome outcome from what had been a fraught and pretty conflictual process. Whilst it did not achieve, however, as much as some had hoped, it certainly was not as damaging as many had feared, and for that we can be grateful. A long story lies behind that resolution, but today is not the time to talk about it. But it is important to note that going into that process, the then High Commissioner had argued for what became known as a master calendar for reporting basically using the maths that if there are 10 treaty bodies and 10 reporting obligations roughly to be, and, um, and roughly four or five years um, uh, reporting cycles, then why not schedule two reviews for every state every year? Sounds so simple. In fact, that would have required a dramatic increase in the numbers of weeks each year that the committees were required to meet. In fact, her proposals estimated they would have to rise from 73 weeks of meeting to 124 weeks. The cost of doing that would be completely, well, would be prodigious. And because of this, the report also suggested numerous cost savings measures that could be made in order to facilitate this. But even taking those measures into account, the cost of running the system would in fact have, would in effect have doubled from, to use the figures at the time, about $56 million to about $108 million. And as the High Commissioner must surely have known, that meant that the proposals were doomed from the start. And they were, of course, not adopted in that form, but predictably all the savings for cost savings would, of course, all taken up. But more positively um, and helpfully, a formula was developed to identify the amount of meeting time of committees needed by each committee, at least to address the backlog of reports which were waiting to be considered at that time. It was the stunning truth that if you took for example, the then relatively newly established UN Committee on Persons with Disabilities, so many states had indeed submitted um, reports to that committee, which was only meet, meeting for two weeks a year, it was going to take eight years to consider the reports that had already been submitted. What is the point of submitting, examining a state report that is going to be at least eight years out of date by the time you do so? reducing the backlog was itself a priority. And as a result, the number and length of sessions of the treaty bodies did increase significantly between 2015 and 2020 in order to reduce the backlog. But reducing the backlog did nothing to address the fundamentals of the system and the fundamental incapacity of the system to address all reports that might actually be submitted if states were fulfilling their obligations. So to that extent, what we had was, as others have put it, a sticking plaster, not a solution. And indeed, the resolution itself accepted that because it called for a further review of the treaty body system no later than 2020. And that, of course, is around where, where we were during last year, and we will come back to that too. Stepping back a little 
I think it is important just to underline what in more detail the central problem with the treaty body reporting system is. It's actually perfectly clear. It's not so much that it doesn't work properly, it's that it simply cannot work properly anymore if it continues to operate as it currently does. Hence the reason for some radical rethinking about how it might do its, to go about its work. And there's no mystery here. All that's needed is a simple broad brush calculation. There are, in broad brush terms, about 200 states in the world with the region of 10 sets of reporting obligations across the various human rights treaties falling roughly every four or five years. The variables in that all cancel each other out and that's basically what you end up with. If there were, as there should be, universal ratification of these treaties, each treaty body would need to be able to examine around 40 to 50 countries, 40 to 50 reports each year. The current formula agreed by the United General Assembly assumes that it takes about two and a half days of meeting time to consider a state report, or two every week. And that is roughly what practice suggests is just about possible. That means that if there was universal ratification and full reporting compliance, a treaty body would need to spend between 20 and 25 weeks each year considering reports. That is, before consider considering individual communications, producing general comments and all the other things they have to do. Yet no treaty body currently meets in plenary for more than 12 weeks per year and many significantly less. And bearing in mind that members are not paid for their work, it is unreasonable and in practice all but impossible to think that they can do any more than that. And, but even if they did try, there is simply the physical incapacity within the office of the High Commissioner to allow this to happen. Now, this is all very boring stuff for academics and even for diplomats, but it underpins the bottom line of what the realities of the system are that in other ways we spend so much time reflecting on. The fundamental, irreducible and undeniable point is that the treaty body system simply cannot cope with universal ratification and full compliance by states of their reporting obligations if state reports continue to be considered by the treaty bodies in the way that they are. Some circles can't be squared and this is one of them. And as the High Commissioner has said, what makes the system appear workable is that some, but not all conventions, are still some distance from universal ratification and also because of the continued failure of so many states to report. As a result, it is just about possible to keep on top of those that do report. And the 2014 strengthening process did indeed help to bring about this improvement, but it did nothing to address these fundamental structural problems. And it's important to be clear this is not just a case of failed process management. This failure is process management. Process management by those or some of those who simply do, who want to and do ignore their reporting obligations and want to evade uh, effective and meaningful scrutiny of their human rights records. And this undermines the entire integrity of the system of UN human rights protection as established by the treaties. It matters. It's also important, I think, to highlight that two of the most widely hawked solutions to the problems faced by the human rights treaty body system during these um, strengthening discussions have real, no real bearing on these fundamental problems at all. The key argument from states was that the treaty bodies needed to become more efficient by, quote, harmonizing their procedures. Yet even if all the treaty bodies adopted the same working methods, this hardly helps if none of those approaches is adequate to address the underlying issues. Harmonization never was the answer. It was little more than a device for pinning the blame for systemic failure on the treaty bodies, 
rather than on a failure of institutional design. Similarly, the demand that states spend more money on the system also miss the mark. Whilst funding problems are real enough and certainly contribute towards the problems, once again, even a bottomless pit of money can't expand time. At the end of the day, the system as configured and operated just can't work properly and something needs to change, but will it? In June 2019, the chairs of the treaty bodies took the initiative of uh, formulating a common position paper to inform the thinking of the 2020 review of the system by the General Assembly that had been announced in the previous resolution. The principal and controversial innovation, though it hardly seems one to say so, was the abandonment of the idea of harmonization across the system. Rather than seeking to agree upon a common approach, the chairs, as argued by states, the chairs endorsed the idea of diversity. Whilst all committees could agree on a common set of problems and even a single suite of potential solutions, each had to be able to pursue its own path in working out what was the best solution for it. It hardly sounds radical, but assure you, it felt so when it was adopted. And the implications would be too. For example, the Covenant Committees, the Human Rights Committee and the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, favoured the lengthening of the reporting cycle, which is currently four or five years, to eight years. Others, now called the Convention Committees, tended to prefer shorter reporting cycles, four years, but recognised that this might mean making compromises elsewhere to make the numbers add up, either as regards the length of time devoted to reviews, or whether reviews would be undertaken by the whole committees or by subgroups, etc, etc. In other words, each one could square the problem in its own way to the best of its ability. As this suggests, common problems didn't necessarily require common solutions and each body could seek the solution best suited to itself, but within a coordinated overall framework. This is all still quite technical stuff. The most significant of the chair's proposals, however, went much further and sought to turn the current way of considering state reports on their head. Rather than states meeting with the committees in Geneva, the idea was that the committees should actually meet with states parties, not in Geneva, but in their region, either at a regional level or in the country itself. The inspiration for this lay, at least in part, in the work of the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, which is focused on undertaking visits to places of detention within its states parties and meeting with officials and authorities in situ in order to discuss implementation issues. There are many advantages in this. First and foremost, it brings the consideration of compliance by the state with its treaty obligations closer to the rights holders and makes the entire exercise more immediate and accessible for everyone. It is also far easier and cheaper for both states officials and NGOs to have such discussions in their own country or in a close neighbour than travelling at great expense to Geneva to undertake these. And discussing compliance in country removes some of the formalities of international discourse which inevitably infects much discussion in what is ultimately, like it or not, a diplomatic forum in, in Geneva. And speaking from my own experience, I can absolutely attest to the fact that the discussions held with state officials in country around such issues can often be very, very different to the type and more productive than the type of discussions you are likely to have under the gaze of, shall we say, the diplomatic forum in Geneva, webcams to capitals in the world. Um, transparency is not always the, um, the best way of achieving outcomes in human rights focused discussions. But considering, so considering reports within the country concerned or the region concerned transposes those discussions to a potentially more appropriate setting. And this is not just a pipe dream. 
The first such regional meeting was trialled by the Committee on the Rights of the Child over four days in April 2020, and it proved very successful. And then came COVID. In April 2020, the traditional way of treaty body working ceased when it became no longer possible for treaty body sessions to be held in person in Geneva. It took a long time for them to move online and there was widespread concern about them moving online, motivated in part by that concern to use the expression that what goes online stays online. And this was a very particular worry and concern at the time because the 2020 review was just about to commence in earnest. So what would that mean for it in practice? But COVID-19 was not the only reason why the treaty body system was in turmoil throughout 2020. In the previous year, in May 2019, it had been announced that the sessions of some of the treaty bodies at the end of that year would simply all be cancelled as there was insufficient funds available within the um, Office of the High Commissioner to pay for them. This was ultimately averted, um, but it became absolutely clear at the opening of that year, before um, COVID, that if sessions were, the sessions of 2020 were almost inevitably going to be curtailed for the want of financial resources to be able to support them. So against this background, much of the discussions concerning the 2020 review had already taken on an air of detached unreality, focusing on they did on the nuances of procedural issues concerning the conduct of sessions, which in all probability were not going to be taking place anyway. The implications of all this were pretty obvious. If during the COVID-19 pandemic, the treaty body system could get by without holding expensive Geneva plenary sessions, why hold them at all? What happened? Well, one of the enduring mysteries of the 2020 review announced, bear in mind, back in 2014, was how exactly it was ever going to be conducted because frankly, nobody knew. Um, and so all the time that there were potential preparations, people simply didn't know precisely what it was you were preparing for. And it was not until April 2020 that some degree of clarity emerged when Morocco and Switzerland were appointed as co-facilitators of a process to produce a report which was to be submitted to the President of the General Assembly in um, by September 2020, and that is ultimately what happened. There had, of course, been a great deal of background discussion and proposal before that, but quite how the review was going to take place um, was, as I say, a very difficult question and clearly uh, was um, hampered um, preparation for it in some ways. What happened? A report was submitted. In December of 2020, the General Assembly took note of that report, and for now, that's it. And I've done some follow-up since then, and it remains it. Nothing else has happened since. Unlike the previous exercise that led to a substantive resolution, that has not happened. That is probably a good thing. The report, but the, although the, the review seems to have vanished, it hasn't sort of vanished without trace. The trace it left behind was the report of the co-facilitators and of course the preliminary work which others put in and the thinking that was put in in preparation for what was arguably one of the greatest non-events in the history of the treaty body system so far. The, what does the report itself however say? Perhaps inevitably it reflects the preoccupation of states that there needs to be greater alignment, also known as harmonization, of the processes. That was inevitable 
and continues to reflect the tired, unproven theory that if all the treaty bodies were to undertake their functions in the same way, then it would be done more efficiently and perhaps more effectively. And there remains as much evidence for this now as there ever has been, which is to say there isn't any. But more positively, the report endorses with some enthusiasm the introduction of a master calendar with varying reporting cycles, thus implicitly accepting the key philosophical premise of the chair's position paper, that the treaty body system can embrace operational diversity in order to achieve its goals of rights protection. And it also finally embraces the idea advanced by the High Commissioner in 2012 and rejected in 2014 of a master calendar. And it's worth saying in parenthesis, does that really matter? The short answer is yes, because the idea of a master calendar implies that there is a slot for the consideration of every state within a cycle. That means that those states who do not submit reports nevertheless have their slot within the cycle. This facilitates the way for those states who are not, who do not submit their reports to be considered in the absence of a report, which currently happens extremely rarely. But this would in effect mainstream the idea that you either are considered on the basis of your report or you are considered without a report, but obviously with inviting them to come. And from a treaty body point of view, this closes one of the big gaps and problems with the current system that those states who frankly choose not to submit reports effectively avoid scrutiny. And that is of course the antithesis of what should be the case and also meets one of the complaints of some of the states who do routinely submit reports that basically the good states get the criticism, the bad states get nothing. And so there is more than the master calendar than just a scheduling of meetings. And so an endorsement of that is a big win. But without doubt, the most remarkable and unexpected element of the report from my perspective, is its support for in situ reviews. The idea of taking the work of the treaty bodies out of Geneva into the region or into the country. And indeed, it's fair to say that the attractions of this are set out with considerable more vigor and enthusiasm in the report itself than in the chair's position paper where they are rather hesitantly put forward. It seems to be a ringing endorsement of the treaty bodies working in more diverse ways and in more diverse locations in order to fulfill their mandate. Now inevitably there are some potential negatives too and as feared by the chairs the issue of online working looms large throughout the report. Described in terms of a digital shift in the working practices of the committees it remains, remains possible, uh, it remains to be seen, therefore, whether it's truly possible to return fully to the pre pandemic working methods of the committees, although at the moment this does appear to be on the horizon, with them resuming their in person meetings um, shortly, uh, beginning to do so, and throughout this year. Whether the funding for that continues into next, we hope. But the idea of online working is clearly something that isn't going to go away. The trick will be, as in so many walks of life, harnessing the positives that it offers and not the negatives that it can imply. But relief at the return to in-person in meetings in Geneva, relief at return to the status quo ante, is in fact hardly a step forward in addressing the fundamental issues which I outlined earlier. And it does require, I do need to make another negative concerning the outcome of the review. The co-facilitators accepted there was a very real need for change in the funding of the system. The General Assembly resolution noting their report decided however to reaffirm the current and inadequate budgetary formula which is only focused on dealing with backlogs of reports rather than creating the space for 
um, considering all reports and truly bringing the system in, into the place it needs to be. This is hardly a surprise. It has been a long time since human rights protection has featured highly in the collective budgetary consciousness and priorities of UN member states. But what it does mean um, is that once again, and just like most of the other exercises over the last 20 years, there has been a great deal of discussion, time, energy and money devoted to consider how to strengthen the work of the human rights treaty bodies, but the fundamental structural problems and challenges remain unaddressed and in large part unacknowledged. Surveying the last 20 years then, it is also remarkable how relatively unambitious the treaty bodies until now have themselves been in confronting these problems, largely no doubt because they've been too busy struggling with the day-to-day -day problems to focus on the bigger picture. And despite some changes, the process of considering a report today still looks and feels very much like it did in a different world of 25 years ago. And so, although in some senses, the 2020 review did not really happen, arguably the most positive outcome of it has been that the treaty bodies still reeling from their battering, and they were battered in the run up to the 2014 General Assembly resolution, for the first time really embraced some relatively radical thinking about how to meet the fundamental practical challenges facing the system. And then this was juxtaposed with the need to embrace entirely new working methods due to the COVID pandemic. And so new ideas, new ways of working. Is there to be a renaissance at last? Somewhat against the odds, the chair's vision for the future of the treaty body system can still be advanced. The question now is whether the treaty bodies can retain their focus on that vision and work to deliver it, or will the system continue to its slide into the routine, mechanical, relatively ineffectual process that it was on the cusp of becoming? Regretfully, I think I know the answer to that question, but I do so hope I am wrong. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sir Malcolm. That was really great to have your inside, your perspective, because you really were at the at the core, in the midst of all the discussion uh, about reform of the system over the over the past ten years. Now, um, I see we already have one question in the Q and A box. I will I would like to encourage uh, participants to continue to write uh, their questions that we will uh, take towards the end of the webinar. Um, I'd like to start off with a few questions myself. I understand now that tonight we're talking about what really doesn't work and how to address it. But I'd like to, before going back into some of the very interesting points that you've made, um, to go back to your role uh, as the, you know, the former chair of the SPT. And I'd like to hear from you some of the positive stories uh, the, the advancement of or just one success story uh, that you have witnessed as the chair over the past 10 years. When one's asked to list successes, it, it can be quite terrifying because when you think of the things that you put most effort into to bringing about, you tend to think, was that really a success uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things? Um, but I will say from a, a, a more systemic point of view, people often ask whether human rights treaties can make a difference. And if I've sounded incredibly frustrated this evening, which I suppose I have, it is born of a complete commitment that these could and should be transformatory instruments that have the potential to make a huge positive impact. And it's just so frustrating when that isn't properly actioned and, and realized and released. And I suppose the positive achievement that I would point to, if I just point to the, my own convention for a moment, is what I still think is arguably one of the most remarkable achievements of the system overall. 
oddly, the 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 um, subcommittee for prevention of uh, the, the the optional protocol to the torture convention basically does two things. It establishes the international body, the subcommittee for prevention, with this quite um, remarkable mandate to be able to go at any time it wishes to any place of detention in any of its states parties with completely unfettered access. And one of, in retrospect, it's easy to say that, and then you do it, and then you suddenly step back and think, gosh, you know, actually operationalizing this mandate within, within a UN context and making it work is itself an incredible achievement. And the willingness of states who often have resisted such things is quite incredible too. Um, so just making it work, you know, it's what you do, but when you step back and look at it, you think, well, actually, that's quite an achievement. And particularly the way that the example of that has now fed into all these discussions about much more UN human rights work of treaty bodies being in-country focused. But the second thing that the optional protocol does, quite uniquely, is to require all states parties to set up independent systems of national oversight within states parties. And as a result, in there are 90 states parties, and now in about 60, 70 countries around the world, there are independent bodies able to go into all places of detention on the basis that I, that I described, um, and they do so on a daily basis. And so there is, and they are part of a global web of torture prevention created under the optional protocol. And so to me, it's not only that states which historically would have refused such things full stop are now accepting it, but there is a greater partnership between implementation of human rights obligations at international treaties, but at the national and at the international level with each supporting their other, not so much in opposition. And this changes the nature of debate. And I think that's the real big, big, um, big success story that I've seen over the course of the 10 years and the big challenge I suppose the real challenge is actually to try to roll out the benefits of that into other areas of human rights protection through the UN knowing just how powerful it can be. The biggest challenge I can say it in a word UN bureaucracy. Many of us work in university work in government we thought we knew all about difficult bureaucracies no we didn't try the UN. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I think this the, the success story uh, part at least is is really useful for this discussion because I think we have to remember that the, the system does work. It's not entirely broken. When it works, it can actually advance human rights uh, quite quite effectively. Uh, but now going back to one of the points you made early on about this system being on the verge of collapse and actually a system which would collapse if all the state uh, would report on time. Uh, that's really quite a, quite a striking point, uh, an unfortunate one. Uh, could you perhaps say a little bit more about the lack of compliance from states with regard to reporting? Uh, I understand that they may not uh, want to be a push now for states to all report on time because, as you say, the system just cannot sustain that. But why do states uh, not uh, comply with the obligation. You mentioned, you know, avoiding scrutiny. Is there also a lack of capacity, a, a lack of willingness? And for those who do report, um, are the reports always of a quality that is sufficient to be considered effectively? Hmm. Um, the latest figures I've seen suggest that across the system as a whole, and it varies greatly from treaty to treaty, around about a third of all reports initial reports, the first one when you join the system and the periodic ones you should be submitting later are simply not, not submitted. Um, that's quite a lot. Um, reasons for that will vary. Um, many reports of course are submitted late in addition to that. Given that some are reporting late, what some states tend to do is in effect, you know, just skip a cycle and catch up later. Um, and, and, and so it may not be quite as bad as it appears, but it is also the case that there are uh, 
shall we say, a relatively small number, but a significant number of states who either choose not to report to some treaties at all, or if they do so, it can be five, 10, 15 years before they do. There are some states which have been parties to treaties for longer than that, and they've never fulfilled even their basic obligation of an initial report. And you may find that whilst some states will submit their initial report, they then, having done that, lose their enthusiasm and follow and um, periodic reports are, are few and far between. And again, it's difficult to generalise the reasons um, um, for this, but it is what it is. And particularly if without a report, you haven't got the peg on which to hang a consideration. If you can consider a state that was due to report in the absence of a report, it may be unfortunate, but it's not so much of a problem. If you require the report in order to consider that state, then it is a much bigger problem. And so, you know, that, that, that is something to bear in mind. The quality of report inevitably varies greatly. Um, it's difficult to know what you expect of a report. States do, you know, one of the big changes of late has been to help states by moving over to what's been called the simplified reporting process, or as it used to be known, the list of issues prior to reporting, which was a bit more graphic and helpful. It's pretty basic, really. Rather than ask a state to submit a report on everything and then wonder what it's going to be questioned on, the treaty body helpfully identifies a list of things it's particularly interested in advance and say, focus on these in your report, please, um, because that's what we're really interested in at the moment. It sounds so simple, but there are complexities with doing that too we needn't go into. But, you know, so those are, are useful innovations that, that, that help states. But it is notable that states, dare I say it, do make a meal of reporting to treaty bodies. The number of times I have heard you know, them say, it's so complicated, it's so difficult to produce these reports. Really? You know, they produce far more complex reports to very many other bodies on a pretty daily basis. I've heard some states which I know have been submitting complicated, you know, detailed pleadings before the International Court of Justice in complex, um, in complex cases, saying that they find it difficult to write a 50 page port to a treaty body because they don't quite understand what's required of them. It doesn't take much to work it out. Um, so there's a lot of excuse making around this and a willingness to accept excuses that simply wouldn't be accepted in other quarters. But the treaty bodies don't want to understandably make those points because they want to have a, or should be wanting to have a constructive dialogue. And arguing with states in this way before you start is not a great way of getting a constructive dialogue off the ground. The thing that has probably helped compliance more is when states want to either get elected to the Human Rights Council, it's good to be up to date, and UPR. When people use UPR, to Universal Periodic Review, um, in the Human Rights Council to question why states have not been. And so to the extent that there has been an improvement, my guess is it's got more to do with UPR than it has been with fidelity to the reporting obligations under the treaties which is a little bit depressing, but if they get the reports, hey, take your wins. Right, so a politicization really uh, of, of the whole process. Uh, there's one more concept also I would like to, to go back to, and I understand your frustration that this is a concept that have appeared under a different guise in the uh, 2020 review, and it's the concept of harmonization mm. uh, that has been rebranded uh, as alignment, as, as I understood. Mm -hmm. um, is there though, because I understand that harmonization is talked about quite a bit within the UN and within other UN um, agencies, entities as well. Uh, and I'd like to play devil's advocate. Is there no benefit at all in seeking some form of harmonization? Uh, of course, there's ben some benefits. I think my point is that the benefits of this have been magnified out of all proportion. Um, not least when you actually look at the sort of things that they're talking harmonizing and I, I, I hesitate even to mention some of them because they're so trivial it's almost embarrassing. No it is embarrassing. Um, you know, some things harmonization is really good for. Um, that for example I mentioned the list of issues prior to reporting what's become known as the simplified reporting procedure. Quite why some treaty bodies wouldn't adopt this 
is frankly a little bit beyond me. And it's taken quite a while for them slowly to agree to do this and harmonizing, aligning what they do about that is jolly good sense. And having a push to do that from, um, from states parties in my, you know, I think is a good thing. So I'm not against it per se, where it really can make a difference. But much of the debate about harmonizing, you know, stand by to be embarrassed, is about um, when states are questioned during reporting processes. Should you have a, uh, members asking their questions one at a time and answered, or can you cluster? groups of questions so you ask three questions at once and get three answers why do you need to harmonize that the length of opening statements oh in some committees they will allow states to make an opening statement of only 15 minutes in others it's half an hour we need to harmonize this why and do you really need to discuss that on the floor of the general assembly i think not and, and there are so much more like that. A day to be considered something. Can it be split overnight so it's an afternoon and a morning as opposed to a single day? Well, who needs to harmonize things like this? Well, apparently states thinks it's absolutely vital to the effectiveness and efficiency of the system. It isn't. And so this is part of the problem. People on the outside, you think, well, the idea of harmonizing key processes, what's wrong with that? And then you look at what it is they're talking about and the idea that this is a great step forward is not quite what it seems. Um, you mentioned the word harmonizing and alignment. I, I will admit I'm semi-responsible for the alignment language. It's part <laughs> of my greatest achievement within the, with the entire process. Um, bottom up, top down, alignment is more acceptable to treaty bodies. It's them deciding what they do to get what they learn from each other and bring their processes alongside each other. Harmonization is a top down thing. You do what everybody else does. I'm sorry, but that's where the nuance of the debate lies. And so we, we have always been no keen on aligning procedures rather than harmonizing them. It's quite sad really, isn't it? But there we are. <laughs> Thanks. It's all all in the nuances, and uh, and as you say, what what people uh, understand when they talk about harmonization can be quite different uh, from one stakeholder to the next. Uh, now I'd like to go back to uh, one actually proposal that was made uh, by the chairs to this 2020 review, and that you said has uh, much more hope of actually bringing uh, some transformative change, and that's the possibility of in-person uh, meetings. And for having seen, I don't know if you would agree with, the, with, with that perspective, but from um, having uh, witnessed some UPR session, I mean, sometimes um, states coming to Geneva to discuss the human rights record um, are perhaps may seem a bit defensive uh, and perhaps even conducting a sort of, of PR exercise of um, you know, damage control exercise. And I think this idea that, that you mentioned, this constructive dialogue between the treaty bodies and the state sometimes may also appear uh, a little bit lost. And I think in-person meeting is perhaps uh, a remedy to that perspective. Um, but I'd like to know a little bit more how these proposals came about, uh, because I think it's a very interesting initiative from the chairs. And if, if I understand, that's the first time that there was such an initiative from, from the chairs of the treaty bodies. Yeah. First of all, I need to be quite clear that I don't think it's a question of either or. I think there is a very important place for the, shall we say, fairly formalised consideration of states' reports in the fairly formal atmosphere of Geneva, in the public gaze. I wouldn't want that not to be there. The question is whether that is the only thing that should be there. And of course, doing that means that everything is tied to formal plenary sessions with all the limitations and problems that we've alluded to. The idea of treaty bodies spending more time or spending some of their time in country, you know, and some of them do. They have follow up processes and procedures that often do take them to countries, although these are often, should we say, perhaps unacknowledged and un unrecognized and certainly possibly under supported by the UN. So I wouldn't want to suggest that they do nothing in country at the moment. 
So it's not that difficult to persuade some treaty bodies that um, actually this is a good way of following because when developing their work, because when it comes to follow up work, many of them are already in, a, in, in effect although informally doing such things as it is. Mainstreaming those developments into part of the system is what we're really talking about here. Acknowledging that role, building on it, formalizing it, acknowledging it and facilitating it. And I think that is where the chairs are, are, came from within this proposal. And it also gives much greater, um, you know, should we say greater flexibility of how you engage. You don't need to do it within the confines of the plenary meetings. You don't need to do it with the full committees. Um, the, the experience of my committee, the full committee, with 25 members, we visit every country and every prison, you send groups, you send delegates who then report you know, you know, you report back under the under the banner. It gives much greater flexibility of response, and above all else, the the the, the nature of the conversation that you can have can be very much different than it will be in, as you say, the the stylized means um, in 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 Geneva. It also means some of those work can take place outside the regular plenary meetings, freeing up more time for the things that do need to take place there, and so on. So there's a whole host of advantages. But frankly, the origins of the chair's proposal were, um, I think there's an interesting story there in from a process point of view too. Um, but it's again reflective of part of the problem. As you rightly said, the, 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 the driver here is the meeting of the chairs of the treaty bodies, which over the years, the state's parties and the previous resolutions have asked to take a greater role in, they would call it coordinating the system. Um, I don't think we would say one could coordinate it, but to play a, a higher profile within that. But inevitably, chairs change and some of them change very frequently. If you've only got a meeting of chairs that meets once a year, as is currently the case, frankly, it's very difficult to build up the, if you like, the chemistry and the DNA of the body to be able to make bold changes. That requires confidence and trust between bodies where they may not know each other what they do, and there may be some frictions at times. That takes a while. It also means there's a lack of institutional knowledge and memory about how things have happened. And following the 2014 um, exercise, um, come 2016, most of the chairs were different and they couldn't see that the 2020 review, you know, was an important thing. And so a group of chairs, three of us, who had been at the previous one decided frankly that it was time to try galvanize things and so um, I suppose starting on a rooftop bar in New York we sort of came up with a set of ideas we then organized a completely informal discussion at Wilton Park um, with, with key stakeholders to float various ideas that was then the baton passed to the Danes then who did the same in um, in, 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 in Copenhagen and at that point we were able to bring in all the different chairs of the treaty bodies and get a private understanding between chairs in a private fashion about what we thought the future was. This is important because although I didn't mention it there was also a forward thinking process which was very helpful being run by the Geneva Academy at the time that was also inputting into this process but dealing with different stakeholders including the chairs but we felt a private think between ourselves from our perceptions only as chairs would be valuable and having seen that it was and constructing something of an as a private thing, we were then able to formally take it to the chairs meeting in, an, in a formal capacity and have this adopted. So, you know, it was a it was a difficult, interesting process in how to gain, if you like, trust between the committee chairs, discussion and buying in an informal way before you could then get, you know, take it into the more public arena, te road test it there, refine it and have that put forward. But it did mean that when it was put forward as a template, it was quite widely um, accepted, not only across the treaty body chairs, but also by the other people with whom we've been trying it out in states. So it didn't come from nowhere, put it that way. I think that's really interesting to know the ins and outs and, and how it came about. And you, you talked about the di digital shift. 
and the way the pandemic has you know, forced us all really to think kind of differently uh, about the way we work. It has advantages, it has disadvantages. But here it's quite clear that the in-person meeting in New York uh, was very favorable to you brainstorming ideas. And you wonder if the pandemic would have happened at the time, if actually this, this idea would have taken off the ground in, in the, quite the same way, perhaps, perhaps not. I have a lot of other questions to ask you and, I'm, and I could talk to you for an, another hour, but I do see that we have a lot of questions uh, that have come from our online participants. So I will now um, leave the floor to my colleague, Iris, who has been going through some of those questions and will ask them. Hello all, thank you for the questions and thank you, Sir Malcolm, for the um, lecture today. Um, so one of the members of the audience, uh, Lovely Hudson, would like to uh, know whether there is any serious discussion about establishing, uh, establishing a single treaty monitoring body, which I know he touched upon in your speech today. Well, there, as, as, as many will know, there has been over the years. In fact, this goes back to um, Philip Alston's proposals you can go back to about 19, um, was it 1999 or was it 1989? A long time ago that have been, and, and certainly um, the High Commissioner in the early 2000s was pressing for a unified treaty body system. But quite frankly, that didn't fly then. And I just don't think it's going to fly now, both with the treaty bodies themselves and indeed with, 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 with states parties too. So whatever the intellectual merits of it, and I can see it as an enterprise, I suppose I've reached the view that it's frankly just not a practical solution to the problems and spending time discussing it simply is a diversion from what truly can be achieved and needs to be achieved in the short term. Um, it would basically mean the creation of a full-time um, a full-time treaty body, how you would draw the membership of that, they would have to be salaried, they would have to be paid, there are consequences of that in terms of how things would be done. It's, it, it's not that it can't be done, but I think it would take a lot of work, a lot of talk, it would be very controversial, and in the meanwhile, as the, to use the expression, Rome's burning. Thank you. Um, so one of our other uh, members of the uh, audience would like to know uh, whether, who advanced a more radical, as they put it, question, uh, could you envisage state parties that are also parties to regional human rights treaties to be exempt from reporting to the UN treaty bodies? Mm. Now, this one's quite interesting because when the... Um, the, the, the treaty which um, I was chair of was being drafted, um, allowing visits to places of detention within states parties. This was precisely the proposal that was put forward by some within the drafting process because there was a similar mechanism operating in Europe at that time, the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture. And the suggestion was that, well, if you're going to be visited by a European Committee for Prevention of Torture, you shouldn't have to be, that should mean that you're not eligible to be visited by the United Nations equivalent. And that sounds terribly logical, um, but where it completely falls down is within UN parlance in terms of universality, indivisibility, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, you know, the four um, Vienna, um, Vienna Declaration um, statements. It just doesn't work to be able to be seen for some states not to be within the purview of the international instrument because they're a party to a regional mechanism. Um, you know, and also, I have to say, the one of the benefits of working on a global level is that you draw your experience from all corners of the globe and that your experience of the way these rights work out in practice and how to address them has a broader than a broader, a broader base. And that's a valuable, shall we say, additional level of knowledge, which is gained by operating on that on that global plane as opposed to the regional plane. And so I, I, I think it would, although it's, it's sort of logical at one level, 
um, I think it would fall foul of the, shall we say, ideological, um, some ideological questions around this, and again would give the idea that the UN is somehow acting as a default for the states that aren't participating at regional levels. There are some regions that don't have equivalent treaties. They would say that they were being picked on by the UN. And this may be controversial, but at the end of the day, there is a qualitative difference of feel about being shall we say, examined by a UN body than a regional body. Um, I know some people might disagree with that, but the UN imprimatur is an important imprimatur. And I think it's important that all states, even if they are being considered by, by some of the hugely impressive work that's done through the regional human rights instruments, should also be within the purview of the, of the UN too. So I just, I, again, I just don't see that as being a realistic it could help, um, but I, I think it would require some caution in going down that route. Thank you. Um, now, Gianluca Burzi is uh, wondering, um, what do you think about the Universal Periodic Review operating under the auspices of the uh, Human Rights Council uh, and whether it offers a more sustainable model perhaps? Well, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, it wasn't so much of a, of a concern this time round, leading up to the 2020 review, but I can absolutely tell you that in the run up to the resolution 68268, the, the earlier exercise at the start of the decade, one of the very real concerns was that um, things were being, and this was one of the concerns with the master calendar at the time from a treaty body perspective, that it began to look too much like universal periodic review. And that if you ended up with a system where all states were being considered by their fellow states once every four or five years through universal periodic review, and by all states every four or five years through a treaty body process, <clears throat> people would simply say, isn't this duplicatory? We're doing the same thing twice, and it didn't take a genius to work out which one would be axed. <coughs> you know, it would be the treaty body one that would be under threat rather than peer review by states. Um, and so alignment with UPR, synergy is important, but getting too close to it has always been a bit of a concern, lest people say, well, isn't that another example of duplication? Let's abandon the treaty body system, UPR does it for us. UPR is political, it's important, I don't want to understate its significance, it's hugely important, but at the end of the day, it is still scrutiny of states by states, and that is not what the treaty bodies are meant to deliver. They're meant to be doing something different. Thank you. Uh, now, going back to harmonization, uh, Caroline Sweeney is wondering uh, whether you feel that treaty bodies uh, can have common understanding in cross-cutting issues, especially considering the fact that they could, uh, they would want to avoid potentially a co contradictory recommendations. Mm. Well, I have to say that from where, and it may be that I have an imperfect knowledge on this, that's my caveat, but I am just about all the harmonization alignment discussions that I've ever heard have only ever been about procedural issues. Lip service has been paid to doing more to try to align jurisprudence, um, approaches to core issues, and, and certain things have happened. Of course, now and then treaty bodies do try to talk to each other about these things. Um, and, and sometimes it works, sometimes it, it, it doesn't. But is there a great, shall we say, cross-treaty engagement and fertilization on matters of jurisprudence? No. Should there be? Probably. Is there likely to be? Almost certainly not. Um, and there's a whole host of reasons um, for that. Um, you know, uh, you know, a good example was, you know, during the during last year through COVID, the, um, you know, many treaties were 
uh, my own and various others, you know, gave guidance towards states about how they felt the obligations in their treaties should be respected during the COVID pandemic. And it raised quite a lot of pretty serious issues from a human rights perspective. Um, and jurisprudential perspective about how you go about, you know, about how you marry up these these um, competing, you know, problems. Um, and so the committees decide, the chairs decided to establish a what they called a COVID working group to look at precisely these issues. What did it end up doing? Looking at procedural issues about how the system actually engaged. It was just a microcosm of just how difficult they find it to be able to effectively discuss, should we say, cross committee wide, um, let us call them jurisprudential issues if we dare. It's, it's, it shouldn't be that diff is difficult, um, but it is difficult and I don't honestly think people understand just quite how tricky it is to bring that about. Thank you. Um, also, um, Jan Lotsky is asking whether you think it would be useful if some committees merged, such as the HRC and the C CSCR? Well, in a way, this sort of goes back to the business of the unified treaty bodies. If you can't have a wholly unified treaty bodies, can you have a partially unified treaty body system? Well, the short answer is technically you could. Whether it would do its work any better as a result, um, depending on what you think that work is in terms of trying to assist states fulfill their obligations and hold them to account. One of the beauties of the more specialist treaties, at least in theory, is that they should have people with greater expertise in those areas on them. And the more you merge committees, the less likely it is that you're going to have the full range of subject expertise that you should have. Against that, I have to add a huge caveat about the extent to which you know, um, say this ever so gently, there has been an increased polarization, um, should we say politicization of elections in recent years. Um, and, you know, can I say the qualifications and, and expertise of all treaty body members is, is not always as apparent as one would like to think it was. Um, but, you know, moving for bigger committees can dilute focus. Um, there was an opportunity to move in that direction a few years ago because the committee on the um, uh, enforced disappearances did have a provision which it would be considered after its first cycle of reporting and first, I think, five years of operation, whether its work could be combined into that of the Human Rights Committee because when it was established there was a debate do we really need another committee um, but then the General Assembly decided no we do need this separate committee so that's the way so even when there was a formal opportunity to combine it wasn't taken I think that was probably the right decision in that instance and bear in mind at the moment there are uh, GA processes to adopt more committees and so if anything the system is due to enlarge and expand itself not contract into itself. Um, so if, if there's a greater place for, shall we say, synergy, it's not so much between um, <coughs> the treaty bodies, it's something we haven't talked about yet so far, and that's a relationship with the UN special procedures and the extent to whether you need quite so many UN special mandate holders when you have increasing ratifications of the treaty bodies is a different debate and different discussion and I think there's probably more scope for rationalizing there rather than going through the painful process of shall we say drawing together treaties which in only relatively recent years in some instances the General Assembly has brought into being. Thank you. Um, one of the very popular questions we have this evening for you is that uh, Asit Sherib is worried about the funding of uh, individual committee members and, mm. and the fact that they, do, they are not really backed up by a team. Um, and this can lead to inequalities 
uh, between those who are uh, being paid in a different capacity, working in a university or not. Um, and I would like to know what would be your take on that, on uh, ind individual committee members being underfunded. Well, there is a, a vast spectrum here. You know, the, the, the bottom line is that um, all treaty, no, no treaty body members are, um, are, are given a, a, a payment, um, a cash payment for what they do. Um, on days that you are working uh, in, in plenary in Geneva, only in plenary in Geneva, there is a per diem, but then you are responsible for covering your accommodation costs and everything out of that. Um, some do that in such a way that means that they can generate, you know, keep a, you know, a portion of that, you know, in addition by, should we say, saving on how they spend. Um, that's important because some members um, manage to, you know, configure things in some countries in such a way that that then enabled them to have the space to be able to, you know, devote, devote time to the work. Um, others, as you say, are in full-time paid employment where their employers very generously allow them just to carry on doing the work. Um, others are not. Um, uh, and so the pattern for individual members varies hugely. Some members are hugely supported by their state in a positive way, not necessarily because they, they pay them to do it, um, but because they provide research assistance to them, they provide backup teams in order to help them do their roles. You know, on the committee I was a member of, you know, I knew a couple of members who basically had an office back home that was, they were given money by the state to have a backup team working in country to help them fulfill their mandate. I knew other members who received absolutely no help at all and basically were having to, you know, fund themselves to do the job because they were having to give up time and weren't getting any recompense for it. And so there's a huge disparity there and inevitably that affects what different members can, you know, are, are able to do. And, and so there, there, there is an issue here. And if I can say it became absolutely acute during last year, during the Covid, period because because there were no meetings taking place in Geneva at all um, the UN this is the bureaucracy decided that even the the per diems that it would normally give people to pay their their their, their costs which as I say some used to supplement their income to help them do the work wouldn't be paid at all because the rules said they were only paid if you went to Geneva and so as no one was going to Geneva you got nothing. So you would having members spending, you know, on you know, on some committees, four week sessions, um, no technical assistance, no help to provide them with the equipment that they might need or internet connections, um, because this is not what you do for independent experts. They're independent at that point, um, uh, and they were on their own. Uh, and that it, it's those sort of things that that that, that don't help and make things difficult and, and there are real in, in inequalities and inequities in the capacity of different members to be able to fulfill their mandate as a result of all these problems. You know, some are very lucky and they're well supported, etc. Others find it a real struggle and it's a huge commitment and they, they've got to be absolutely commended for the commitment that they put in. Thank you. Um, I believe we have uh, the time for one more question, perhaps. Um, Borislav Petro, uh, Petronov is wondering, isn't it time for a more radical solution? In your opinion, what would be an out-of-box solution to the problem you have posed this evening? Well, an out-of-box solution, you know, still has got to you can't have a completely out of box solution because there's still a box that you have to work in which are called the treaties and as i never sort of sort of tire of telling people whether i'm right or wrong is another question you know even if the un ceased to exist tomorrow there would still be treaties and they would still say there should be treaty bodies um and so this entire fixation with it's all what the ga wants etc etc is um a bit a bit weird at one level and and perhaps in parenthesis it is one of the problems here you know the amount of prescription that the the general assembly has put on the treaty body system is quite remarkable you know it actually tells them what's the longest 
pay, the, the, the page length that it's uh, they're allowed to use on their reports. No treaty body document can be more than 10,700 words, including the executive summary. Um, imagine telling the International Court of Justice it couldn't have a judgment of more than 15 pages. Um, you know, it's it's just not like with like. Um, so there are certain parameters, but you know, to the question of thinking outside the box, partly it's funding. Um, th there is, to my mind, no doubt that states do use the funding lever to subtly control the the nature of the system. Um, you know, so if you like, a, you know, rather than contribute through the, you know, through the, the formulas of the General Assembly budgeting, if some multi-billionaire wanted to endow the UN human rights system with a blind trust to give it the income to be able to do its job better, that would be, that, that would be wonderful. Um, funding is only, however, part of it. Perhaps more realistically, I... I and controversially, I, I do wonder whether the Office of the High Commissioner is really able to service the treaty body system as it should. And I don't mean that in any sense of ill will to the office. It's just that it strikes me, having been working alongside it for many years now, it has got three functions that in most other constitutional walks of life you think are incompatible. It is the executive arm of the Human Rights Council, meant basically to execute the ultimately politically oriented human rights decisions of, their, of, of the Human Rights Council. It is also meant to be running its entirely independent human rights protection mandate through the mandate of the High Commissioner. And at the same time, it is meant to operate as the secretariat of all these independent treaty bodies. Now, that's a very unusual amalgam of tasks. And it may be that the thinking out of the box solution perhaps lies with wondering, well, is the very architecture around human rights protection within the UN focused on the office? I see why the argument was there for it, but is it really capable of delivering in its current guise what, 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 what should be delivered? And I know it sounds a boring point, but any sort of move that meant that you could free the way the system works from some of the quite frankly unbelievable restrictive rules of operating with the UN system and the bureaucracy around the UN system it's not a trivial point would be welcome um, the cost of the system so much of the cost of the system is taking up with shall we say you know putting on event, putting running sessions in a given way that conform to certain sets of expectations and standards which are not set by the committees themselves, but within which they are constrained to work within. There are better, I think there are better ways of doing this. Thank you. I see we have uh, a lot of other questions. I don't think we had a lot of questions coming in and unfortunately time is running out. Um, I would like to just abuse my position of chair and, and use the last few minutes to ask you a couple of very final questions. And one of them actually regards, I mean, you, you, your role, your former role as the, as the chair of the SPT, um, you were um, UK representative, if you wish, within the, uh, the, the treaty body system. Uh, and at present, uh, there is no one from the UK, I understand. So is that something perhaps that you would like to comment on? I, I understand, of course, Bickle has a global reach. Uh, and thanks to our online webinars, we're able to, to reach out to people all, all over the world. And hopefully uh, many people from outside the UK are listening in tonight. But it is also an institute that is rooted in the UK. So it may also interest uh, some of our listeners. Well, well thank you for that. Yes, um, it is. I, 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 well, it was with a great sad, it was great sadness to leave the committee to a point uh, after 11 years on it, but it was a particular sadness to leave after 11 years to know that at that point I then became the, the last member of one of the human rights treaty bodies um, who was elected in respect, uh, elected having been nominated by the UK. There are uh, 10 treaties currently, that means there's 172 different experts from all around the world elected to those committees. For the first time, this is the first year 
since there has ever been a human rights treaty body that, um, that, that, um, that, that the United Kingdom has not had a member of one of them. Um, does this matter? I think it does. Um, it matters on all sorts of levels, not least on the on the signal that it may send out about our, our commitment to the system itself. That's unfortunate. I do believe that the UK is firmly committed to the treaty body system, but it seems an odd way of showing your commitment to it by not participating in it. Um, and not to be seen to be putting forward candidates and running candidates, I think, you know, for whatever reason is noticed and um, is, is, uh, is, is a negative on our mark, on, on, on the country's scorecard, if you like, for what we can contribute towards the better fulfilment of human rights. There are some fantastic people in the, who, who we could nominate, you know, to, to join these committees. Over the years, like mem you know, they've made, there have been fantastically important contributions made by members on on, on the committees that they've been elected to. And it just seems to me, you know, a, a real tragedy, I'll use that word, a tragedy, that we've got to the point where there are no current representatives of the UK. And it also means, um, perhaps after this evening you will disagree, that there are perhaps not so many people who can give those insights into what really makes the system tick from a UK perspective. And I think that's quite valuable too. Um, and so it's not just what we, we people are losing the opportunity to give. I think those within the UK are losing something of an opportunity to receive at the same time. And um, it takes a long time to prepare um, to choose candidates, to run candidates, elections. It's 2021. Would we be able to get a candidate up and running for any of the elections this year? No. Um, next year? Possibly not already. I think there's a very real need to try to put pressure to get us back, you know, to get representation back on these committees. Um, it's important. Thank you. I think that's a very, very clear message for the upcoming uh, rounds of, of nomination. Uh, just to, to conclude, uh, we've talked quite a bit about, you know, the role of states, the role of treaty bodies, this dialogue between the two, but of course, civil society has a role to play as well uh, in the process. Um, and I'm sure some of the, of the people listening in tonight may be wondering, you know, what, what can they do uh, if they are not a representative of, of either party? What can they do, you know, to support the, the strengthening the reforms uh, of this process? Well, it's been one of the, I think, this year, I'll, I'll use the word disappointments across the last 10 years of all these strengthening processes, that the number of civil society organizations that have really tried to get into the skin of this and try to help and influence the outcomes have not been many. And those that, those that have have done a terrific job, but when there are not that many of them, it's difficult. Um, and when some perhaps of the, um, the more influential players are not part of the pack, that is also a difficulty. And so it has been disappointing that, you know, the civil society spends a huge amount of time on, rightly, on let us call it the substantive issues. But the one thing I've learned over the years on this is it's very difficult to get much done through institutions on those fronts if the background machinery isn't working right. You know, if the, if the engine won't, if the engine's clogged up, your car can't move very far. And this is part being part of the problem, unblocking these problems, getting the system to work better enables better human rights protection to happen. And it's a tragedy that we've got to spend an hour and a half talking about better human rights implementation, doing the very thing that I don't really want to do, which is spend all the time talking about nuts and bolts mechanics. But in a way, you sort of have to, because otherwise much of what else can be done just remains well, as I say, there's a difference between a vision and a hallucination. Um, and until you can get these things right, the vision is going to be a hallucination. We need to get these sort of things right and to get people to understand that there is a job to be done in helping the system release its potential. And that's, the, I suppose, the final point I want to leave on, really. There is and remains incredible potential within this system in order to, you know, produce what we want it to achieve. 
it's getting that potential to be released is the problem. We've only looked at one element of it tonight and why that's clogged up and not, not working. Let's find ways, imaginative ways, of trying to release the protection of human rights that the treaties have made possible, because currently it isn't happening as it should and certainly not as it could. Thank you so much, Sir Malcolm. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to you and learning from your experience and uh, your expertise. Uh, and I, I do appreciate that you concluded on some kind of positive uh, note uh, full of, of hope. And, and I think with that lecture, you really uh, gave some pointers as to uh, what direction a change could should, uh, should go. Um, so I would like also to thank, of course, our wonderful events team, especially they had to deal with some uh, issue with our booking systems. And I know they've been uh, trying to work really hard to get everybody into this uh, event live tonight. Uh, also many thanks to uh, Iris, who has uh, led the Q&A uh, in a wonderful manner. Uh, and finally, I'd like to, to thank again all uh, our supporters, the Bickle supporters, uh, who have continued to support us throughout these challenging times. And uh, without, without support, um, we would probably not be able actually to host this event um, free of charge continuously. So uh, thanks to all who continue to support us. And I also hope that many of you who have joined us tonight will join us again very soon for more webinars and hopefully for live events, uh, in-person events in the near future as well. Thank you.